Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for another opportunity that you have given us to come together and feast upon your word. I just ask that for each one of us that you would take and seal to our hearts that which is truth, filter out all of the foolishness and all of the error that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve, and welcome to Blessed Hope Forever. We're studying together in 2 Corinthians, and in our last study, we were in the 6th chapter, at the 2nd verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. If you remember the 5th chapter, it ended with the statement of God's work in Christ, uh, not only reconciling the system, and not imputing men's trespasses unto them, but also in giving to us the ministry of this reconciliation. And our proclamation of the good news is that God has done something in Christ Jesus. That's our message, that's our life, that's our ministry. In verse 2, uh, a rather literal translation of the verse, uh, for he says, I heard thee in an accepted time, and in salvation's day, I help thee. Behold, now is an acceptable time. Behold, now is salvation's day. That's how it literally reads in the Greek, which I believe speaks of the dispensation of grace in which we're living, since verse 1 says that we are exhorted not to receive God's grace in vain. Matthew 1.21. Here we have a prophetic statement being made. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. His people. His redeemed people. The 18th chapter of Matthew, the uh, 11th verse, the Lord Jesus Christ declared the Son of Man has come to save uh, that which is lost. First uh, chapter of Luke in the 68th and the 69th verse, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Redemption and salvation are two different terms. We're redeemed in order to be saved. That is that we would be saved from our enemies and from, all, from the hand of all that hate us and would harm us. Uh, the 77th verse uh, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. This reconciliation, you did not know about it when Christ died on the cross. Uh, I believe that there are at least those two concepts in view that God has done something in Christ and that we are in an area, a period of grace in which we Proclaim not what God is doing, but what God has done. Not what God might do if you do something, but what God has done. Dearly beloved, that it's just that simple. Now, whether that all fits together in your own study, it's something you're going to have to work out. But we are we're redeemed in order to be saved. We're not proclaiming a possible action on the part of, of God depending upon the response of the human. We're not proclaiming a possible action on the part of, of God depending upon the response of the human. That's not our message. Our proclamation is not that God might do something or would in fact do something if you would respond in the correct way so that you uh, satisfied, appeased some angry God or so that you tickled Him correctly or stroked His back in an appropriate fashion. That's not our message. Our message, dearly beloved, our message is that God has accomplished what God intended to accomplish in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are to proclaim it, and that day becomes effective in your life when you know about it. 
Not that it wasn't true. It isn't true. But it becomes effective when you receive the message. I'm not talking about redeemed. I'm talking about you being aware of it. And now the argument of the sixth chapter is not to receive that grace, which is already yours in vain. The word receive in the first verse is an aorist passive uh, that, that God has placed something upon you just like the Father placed the blood on the doorpost and the lentils and the Passover so that something was done for the, for the Son. So the, the Son should not receive it in vain. It won't, it won't make any difference whether He does or not. As far as His life is concerned, He's going to wake up alive because His Father put blood over the doorpost. We received grace. Not we received it. Okay, not some aorist passive. We received it. It's not some in invitation uh, to do something to receive His grace. We received it. It was a gift. We believe God concerning what He did. And, and so and when we do that, it makes a tremendous difference as far as fellowship is concerned. Fellowship with God. Fellowship with one another. The reason for the understanding of this is given in the third verse giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. The word offense there in the Greek is, is the word obstacle or a cause for stumbling uh, in order that no one can find fault with a ministry. Now, you could argue that the primary emphasis of the stumbling is moral. And dearly beloved, I believe without question God has called us to a life of separation not only from spiritual evil, but from physical evil. We are to cleanse ourselves. We'll see that in chapter 7, in fact. Cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the Spirit and of the flesh. So I would never, never, ever say that there's no importance to physical morality in one's Christian life. That is not true. However, considering the context is, is God's ministry of reconciliation, I do not consider it to be too absurd to suggest that we far too often look at the offense as primarily moral rather than doctrinal, theological. And folks, I've, I've said this before, I still believe it today, theological error precedes moral error. And if I am not teaching what this book says, I can cause you to stumble. I become a cause for your stumbling. And I believe that the primary consideration in your carrying this message of reconciliation is that you do not give occasion for doctrinal stumbling. I think that's what the text says. That the primary appeal to pureness is a pureness of doctrine. And then secondarily, an appeal to pureness of life, moral life. And I don't mean by that to reduce at all the importance of the moral aspects of your life. I do mean, however, to highlight the supreme importance of the spiritual aspects of your life. Now then, there are an interesting list of terms uh, between the fourth verse and the tenth verse. And I would like you to take note. I'm going to put this up on the screen. I hope I don't forget it this time. I want you to look at this. I'd like you to take note of one word, in much patience, which is, is a singular. And if I separate that, that word, then what I have is I have three groups of nine. 27 terms to in total, three groups of nine. And I'm going to suggest to you that the first nine are inward, the second nine are upward, and the third nine are outward. Maybe, maybe those are poor words. The, the first nine have to do with the pureness of my understanding of God's Word and my position in the ministry of reconciliation. And the second nine, I believe, have to do with my fellowship and communion, my walk with the Lord, 
and the third nine have to do with my walk with you. And all of those, if you'll take note, all of those are bracketed by the word patience. Patience. You know, it's, it's an easy thing to say, well, you know, if our moral life is right, who cares about the doctrine? I am the first to agree. There's much in the Word of God I do not understand. I'm more than willing to admit that it doesn't embarrass me one bit that the Almighty God could write something that I don't understand. You know, I, I find that even mathematicians do that. A physicist can do that. Medical doctors can do that. I have a hard time reading a prescription. But, you know, if all of those guys can write things that I can't understand, then it doesn't embarrass me one bit that God could write something that I don't understand. But, I also believe that it is an offense to present something that is contrary to the Word of God. If that is in fact the case, and in, in, in my estimation it is, that means that I am then under tremendous constraint to present nothing but truth. Well, I'm persuaded that I don't know absolute truth. And though you, you people may get tired of hearing it, I will continue to repeat it over and over again that what you read in this book is truth. What you hear me say may or may not be truth. And your responsibility is to search the Scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. Furthermore, your responsibility in the proclamation of the message is exactly, exactly the same as mine. And that is that we give no offense in order that God's truth will not be found fault with. I, I shouldn't end with a preposition. Folks, that is a tremendous and a staggering responsibility. I hope that I've been examining my heart, my own heart this week, that I don't shrink uh, from that responsibility by saying, well, you know, hey, I, I don't really know, you know, uh, so I'm going to hope that you people will filter out all of the trash, all the garbage that I put out, and then the Holy Spirit will give you some truth. That would be an easy way out. And basically that what that means is that means that there's no constraint to study. It doesn't matter what I say because I'm going to trust I'm going to I'm going to trust the Lord to re remove the chaff and give you only the grain. But the argument of this passage of Scripture is that there should be a proper constraint on my part and on yours that we carefully present what God said. It seems like every Christian would want to do that. I do not want to teach anything that is contrary to what this book teaches. But it seems inconceivable to me that what God is saying is that, well, no one should teach the Scriptures because no one fully understands them. So I'm led to the conclusion, I'm forced to come to the conclusion in my own life that what I should do is study the best I know how so that I can at least say in the, in the, in the slang of the day, you know, I gave it my best shot. And then trust the Lord in the sincerity of that presentation, to filter out that which is not of Him, filter out all of that which, which is not truth, and I believe God will honor that kind of sincerity. I believe He will. I believe that it's easy to say that this must be what God was trying to do. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell people what God is trying to do you know, God's unable to accomplish it on His own, but what He really wants is you to be redeemed. Therefore, He's, he's, he's set up a trading post you know, where if you just bring in your repentance and you bring in your change of mind and, and bring in your acceptance, then He would, in return for that action on your part, He would grant you eternal life.
And since we've started out with that kind of an assumption, it's an easy step then to suggest if, 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 I, if I got eternal life by trading in something, then I could lose it if I made that transaction invalid. And now we have much of the neurosis of modern Christianity. Whereas the Word of God clearly carries a totally, totally different message. What I hear proclaimed over and over and over again is, I have great news for you. You could go to heaven if you want to. And folks, I cannot find that message in the Word of God. In fact, I'm suggesting to you, and I have for the longest time, that such a message could cause one to stumble. Giving no offense in order that no one can find fault with the ministry of reconciliation. Dearly beloved, God doesn't run a trading post, nor does He award prizes in exchange for your book of, of trading stamps. And so the list begins with afflictions. And I believe that it would be foolish for you to suggest that you are patiently enduring afflictions of the ministry, of the gospel, of reconciliation, when in truth what you're doing is you're sitting in a jail cell because you robbed a bank. I mean, I mean a headache can be an affliction. And you do affect how your body feels, whether, you know, whether it has a lot of weight, whether it has a little weight or a lot of weight, uh, or, or something about how it looks, but, but there are many major areas of your health over which you have no control, none whatsoever, and you would endure patiently in those situations. Folks, I think that the context is how I appear before God in this ministry of reconciliation. The context puts this in the area of doctrine and in the areas of situations in which I, I have no control. The situations I can't control. And I believe those are afflictions. The word is pressures. And then we come to the word necessities. There are necessities. Necessities. And you say, boy, that's one I can control. I mean, if I work real hard, I may have a lot of money and, and, and I have very few needs. If I'm lazy, then I may have very little money and lots of needs, so I can, can control those necessities. And folks, I believe that you have ripped it out of the context. Those necessities, I believe, have to do with the ministry. You know, not a lack of toilet paper on the shelf, okay? You know, but the ministry. In distresses. Uh, not with my family, not with my business, not with getting a, a flat on my lawnmower, but distresses with the ministry of reconciliation. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and in fastings. I'm going to look at I'm going to look at that list primarily as my life before God in the ministry of reconciliation. Now, that may be difficult to do because I find that in most of our lives, we are much more occupied with the job, with the uh, income, the, the bills, the responsibilities of our daily life, and we somehow fuse those, those together. And, I, and I'm not suggesting that our lives are separate from ministry. What I am suggesting is that our priorities many times are separate from the ministry of the gospel of reconciliation. And that our, our priorities become wrapped up in, in, you know, in how we look, uh, you know, how we feel, uh, how successful we are, not in whether or not there's, there's a pure presentation of the gospel, a pure presentation of the reconciliation provided by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that we've done a disservice if we pull those nine terms out of, out of the application of this present context and put it in the way 
my personal day-to-day -day life goes. Now, to some degree, you could argue that those affect how I minister. I simply want to keep in the forefront of our consideration that these are pressures in the ministry of the reconciliation. It's not popular. What we preach is not popular. And you, you, can, you can say, well, I'm not a minister, Steve, you know, but I, I believe you are. I believe you are called as an ambassador to proclaim the reconciliation that God has accomplished in Christ Jesus. And there will be in that, trust me, vast pressures. It's difficult to teach. And the pressures are immense if you're going to do that week after week after week. I believe anything that you undertake for the Lord in the ministry of reconciliation is difficult. First of all, there's the personal pressure just to get it done. You know, secondly, there's, there's, there's always going to be something that goes wrong. Trust me on that. Equipment failure. You know, equipment didn't work right. You know, your car wouldn't start. You couldn't get there. You know, you, you preach the best sermon of your life and you forgot to push the record button or your lapel mic drops off onto the floor. And then there's the intense pressure to modify the message. You know, there is an intense pressure by the religious system, the ecclesiastical system, to destroy the Word of God. They're out to get you folks, okay? I don't think most people realize how much pressure that is. Besides myself, I've known a number of pastors over the years, and believers as well, who by diligently studying the Word of God suddenly came to realize that what they're asked to preach is not what the book says. In necessities, dearly beloved. Sure, we could talk about living out, you know, in our little house, you know, and, and, and we don't have enough food and, and the cupboard's bare and, but folks, I don't think that's the necessity that's spoken of there. Many and many a faithful minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ walks in an area of isolation. I believe Elijah was speaking the truth when he said he didn't know anybody else who was zealous for God. God, of course, had His own, but they weren't fellowshipping with Elijah. 7,000, in fact. That's, that's, a lot of, that's quite a crowd. Now, was it Elijah's fault? I don't know. I, I don't know. I could preach a sermon that he was so arrogant, so conceited, that all of those 7,000 wouldn't fellowship with him. And that may be true. But the Scriptures don't say that. Scripture does tell me that there were a whole bunch of prophets that said that the way you walk is too straight for us. That's your word, afflictions, right here. Same word. Same word. The way that you walk is too straight for us. I looked through the Word of God. It seems to me Elijah stood alone. Jeremiah stood alone. Uh, Isaiah stood alone. Daniel stood alone. Essentially, I don't see mobs of people following these ministers of the truth of the Word of God. I see the mobs following those who had adulterated what God said. And, and not that the ones who had adulterated were going to hell or that they were servants of the devil. No. But I see the false prophets in Jerusalem getting the acclaim. They were, they were preaching the message that the multitude wanted to hear. Dearly beloved, I believe that a close walk with the Word of God is a lonely walk. And the necessity that's mentioned here is not so much that Paul needed food or that Paul needed clothes. 
We, in fact, we have the Holy Spirit declare that he had found in whatsoever state he was therewith to be content. You know, when Paul was arrested in the temple, you know, he had been told before he went in that, that there were thousands of believers in Jerusalem. But none came to his aid. When he writes from prison, all have forsaken me. Only Luke is with me. Paul's life was a lonely life. You know, we, we make him a hero. A hero. You know, he's Superman. You know, boy, if Paul were around today, man, he'd be followed by millions of Christians. You know, he'd be followed by the news media. You know, he'd be, you know, the paparazzi, you know, following the Apostle Paul. Folks, why wasn't it true in his day? I'm sure his walk was a lonely walk. I think the necessities there in our text have more to do with the area of fellowship, of mutual support among believers in the truth of the Word of God, a growth, a, a, a feasting on Him and the Word together in this ministry of reconciliation. Those distresses, we could, we could look at those as the dangers which Paul faced. You know, although I'm, I'm not sure that they're not covered later on, I, I believe that there is a, a, a fitting tie here with his situation in the presentation of this ministry. Was, it, was he not distressed with the condition at Corinth? Was he not concerned because of the attitude of other believers and in, in, in their approach to the Scriptures and how they handled the Scriptures and, and in their dedication and and in their yieldness to God, I, I believe he was truly distressed. And it seems to me today there's a tremendous isolation between the one who's proclaiming the truth of the Word of God and the rest of the flock. You know, we're not, uh, we're not really concerned as long as we're right. You know, We don't care about anybody else. We're not really concerned all that much about his people following uh, all this trash, this garbage, this following harmful, even ruinous heresies, error, following that which is not the truth of the Word of God. We don't seem too concerned. Our distress doesn't seem to be centered in their restoration, uh, in their spiritual growth, in their maturity. You know, no, no, we, we are more concerned about getting a handle on truth ourselves so that we know more than everybody else, you know, and, and can to some degree lord it over them again, you know, rather than be distressed about their spiritual condition. Our primary ministry is to the body of Christ first. And it comes sometimes with a heavy burden in stripes and imprisonments. Surely that's not going to fit. Steve, what you're, that has to be the physical experience through which Paul went. I'm not going to argue that. I'm not going to argue against you on that. I simply want to point out that in all of those physical experiences, the truth of the Word of God was involved, beaten, imprisoned. I mean, were those not connected with his presentation of the truth of the Word of God? Was he, was he preaching what they wanted to hear? Are we not to some degree today preaching a method of law, of good works, of doing something so that God rewards us with eternal life? Well, predominantly, that's modern evangelism. Whereas Paul consistently preached, this is not true, that you are redeemed by grace and by grace alone, and for that he suffered stripes and imprisonments. So may you and me someday, if the Lord tarries. In labors and watchings and, fast, and, and fastings, I, I believe all of those are centered in one's responsibility to the pureness of the gospel of reconciliation. Sticking to the pureness of that message, despite our circumstances, despite how things appear to us, on the surface or on the outside, 
knowing that the pressures of those nine areas over which we have no control, we endure them patiently. What a wonderful, wonderful three, four chapters, you know, that we're, we're traveling through here in this second epistle to the Corinthians that is a scathing indictment on modern evangelism and really lays out the truth concerning the believer's message, his ministry, his life, his walk. I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank all of you for all of your prayers, for the direction of this ministry, for all of your personal prayers, for our, our well-being. We pray for you constantly. Thank you, all of you who support this, this ministry. You know who you are. We love you. I love you. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.